on the DNA uh, DNA B6 isoform knockdown uh, with mechanistic insights and therapeutic potential for LGMD D1. Take it away, Drew. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a, a presentation. And so I just want to acknowledge up front that all this work uh, that I'm going to show you was done by uh, May Pang, Jill Da, Sarah Pittman, and Rothio Bengoechea. All right. So um, LGMD D1, it's a dominantly inherited disorder. It causes proximal muscle weakness that starts in early adulthood and it spreads distally over time, but there are some uh, distal predominant forms that have been reported. And it progresses to cause loss of ambulation around age 40 or 50. And when we look at muscle from these patients, we see myopathic changes with these rim vacuoles shown here on H&E and Gamori trichrome. And you can also see myofibular lesions involving the Z-disc on electron microscopy. And so in 2012, two different groups independently identified uh, mutations in a gene called DNAJB6 as the cause for LGMD D1. And so what is, what is DNAJB6? So it's a, a ubiquitously transcribed co-chaperone and it suppresses aggregation of its clients by interacting with another chaperone called HSP70. And so to, uh, to help illustrate how we think it functions in skeletal muscle at the sarcomere is DNAJB6 will recognize and bind to an unfolded client protein. It'll then recruit HSP70, which then uses ATP to fold that client back into its native state, and then they both release. And then one last uh, important point is that absence of DNA JV6 is embryonic lethal, and that's due to accumulation and aggregation of its client proteins. So it has two different isoforms, a short B isoform and a long A isoform. And then below here's a, a mouse muscle fiber that's been electroporated with uh, both isoforms with different fluorescent tags and then isolated and cultured in vitro just to show the distinct subcellular localizations of the different, uh, the different isoforms. So you can see that the, the B isoform localizes diffusely throughout the fiber, including the sarcomere, which is the site of pathology that we see in, in patient tissue with myofibular abnormalities. And then the A isoform, the large isoform, uh, localizes primarily to myonuclei, um, and this is due to the presence of a nuclear localization uh, sequence. And then disease-causing mutations are depicted by these little red marks, and you can see that they're, they're um, in regions that are shared between both isoforms. But despite mutations affecting both isoforms, we might expect to see some iso isoform-specific differences in the contribution to pathogenesis, as really only the B isoform localizes to sites of pathology that we see in muscle biopsies. In fact, you know, there is some evidence that supports the B isoform alone contributes to disease pathogenesis, despite mutations affecting both. And so Bjarne Udd's group in 2012 um, injected zebrafish with human DNA JV6 mRNA and found that the, when you inject mutant B isoform but not mutant A isoform, it resulted in myogeneration. And then uh, our group in 2015 created four different transgenic mouse models expressing um, either wild type or mutant DNA JB6B or DNA JB6A with a V5 tag and a muscle specific MCK promoter. And then here's a Western blot just demonstrating um, and control muscle, the A and B isoforms. And then in the transgenic mice, the presence of the transgene. And then when you do grip strength testing on these mice, you can see that the, the mice with mutant B isoform are weak compared to the control mice, whereas mutant A mice are not weak compared to their controls. If you look at muscle from the mutant B mice, they have an active myopathy. And if you quantitate it, there's an overall shift to smaller muscle fiber cross-sectional areas. So you know, overall, there appears to be an isoform-specific component to the pathogenesis of DNA JV6 mutations, but really what remains unclear is the mechanism. Is it through haploinsufficiency? Is it dominant negative, a toxic gain of function, maybe a combination of these? And so we, we recently provided some evidence for a toxic gain of function mechanism in this paper from 2020. And so remember, DNA JV6 works with HSP70 um, to fold client proteins back into their native state, and then they both release. So what we found is that disease-causing mutations uh, cause a dominant effect on HSP70's mobility and function in skeletal muscle. 
And this can be rescued either uh, genetically or pharmacologically by inhibiting their interaction. And so you know, this study provides some evidence for a toxic gain of function mechanism, but there are other studies that provide good evidence for a dominant negative mechanism. And so really be because of the precise path and mechanism remains unclear, our next research questions have aimed at clarifying the B isoform's role using more sort of unbiased approaches. And then given the B isoform seems to preferentially contribute to disease pathogenesis, you know, could selective reduction of the uh, B isoform levels be a therapeutic target? And so to address these questions, we developed a strategy to selectively knock down the B isoform in either wild type or mutant uh, myotope cultures, and then followed this by mass spectrometry to characterize and compare um, the different proteomic signatures of each condition. And so the, the mechanism governing DNA JB6 isoform expression was recently characterized and it involves a competition between alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation. Um, and so shown here is a gene map of DNA JB6, which includes 10 total exons and production of the long A isoform. It really depends on activation of intron 8 splicing and use of this strong distal polyadenylation signal whereas production of the B isoform requires a lack of intron 8 splicing and use of this weak proximal polyadenylation signal. And so then designing a knockdown strategy that targets just the B isoform is difficult. It can't, it can't be selectively targeted with traditional methods like siRNA. It only contains 10 unique amino acids compared to the A isoform, and it also has significant sequence homology to other DNAJ paralogs. And so what we did was we designed a strategy that targets the proximal polyadenylation signal using morpholinos, which are a type of ASO, that don't result in degradation of its target sequence, but instead just sterically blocks the sequence, in theory preventing the polyadenylation, excuse, preventing the polyadenylation and theoretically resulting in uh, production of only the, the A isoform. And so for the rest of this presentation, I'll refer to this morpholino as BPAS, as it targets the polyadenylation signal of the B isoform. So we first uh, tested this morpholino in vitro um, in primary myotube cultures that were established from a, a LGMD D1 mouse model. They're heterozygous for this F90I disease-causing mutation. And then they also have a flag tag on the wild type allele to detect any potential allele-specific differences. So myotubes were cultured with morpholinas at three different uh, doses for three days prior to collection. So this is a, a multiplexed RT-PCR of both uh, A and B isoforms. And you can see that BPAS treatment reduces the B, uh, B isoform transcript even at the lowest dose. And then to the right here is qPCR data showing um, for the same thing that wild type and mutant myotubes treated with BPAS reduces the B isoform while leaving the A isoform alone. And this works at the protein level as well, so you can see that even at the lowest dose, it reduces uh, levels of the B isoform. You'll notice that on the Western blot, there's two bands for each isoform, and that's due to the presence of a heterozygous flag tag. And then here to the right, um, are just bright field images of uh, treated myotubes demonstrating there's no morphological evidence of toxicity. So we, we then optimize the morpholino treatment in myotubes to improve isoform-specific knockdown while at the same time maximizing the maturity of myotubes up to 10 days of differentiation before sending them for mass spec. And so the, the first question we can look at using our proteomic data is, is, does reduction of the B isoform mimic or recreate the disease proteome signature? Or, or put in a different way, is LGMD D1 due to a loss of B isoform function? And so shown here is a comparison of the differentially expressed proteins between the F90I myotubes and wild-type myotubes treated with BPAS, and then using wild-type control cells as a reference for both. And so without looking at the individual proteins, what's interesting to notice is that a majority of the uh, differentially expressed um, proteins in the wild-type BPAS treated cells are in fact also contained within the F90I disease profile. Um, but you know, knocking down the B isoform really only reproduces about a third of the disease profile, suggesting that uh, disease pathogenesis can't solely be explained by loss of the B, uh, B isoform. 
And so again, given the possibility of a, a toxic gain of function mechanism involving the B isoform, we treated these F90 high myotubes with BPAS and sent them for mass spec to see if reduction of the B isoform might have some therapeutic potential. And so shown here is um, the 23 different proteins that were differentially expressed in the F90i myotubes compared to wild type. We use a log two fold change of at least 0.75. And then data is presented here as a, a heat map with the log two fold change with yellow colors um, indicating increased expression compared to wild type and then the dark blue colors uh, representing reduced expression. And, so, uh, and then we use the wild type control treated um, uh, with morpholino um, is set to zero because it's the reference. And so when we look at um, the proteomic data from the uh, BPAS treated cells, we see that 12 of these 23 profile proteins were actually corrected to wild type levels, suggesting that isolated reduction of the BIS form may in fact have some therapeutic potential. And so we also looked at um, all the proteins that were differentially expressed following BPAS treatment and found that only 16 proteins uh, expression levels were changed, 12 of which were within the disease profile, and then four that were not. And then lastly, we looked at potential off-target binding sites for BPAS. And the closest target had three mismatches, um, and its expression levels weren't changed in the proteome data set. So given the therapeutic potential of the strategy, we decided to move forward with some preliminary in vivo testing. And um, we first treated mice with an intramuscular injection of control morpholino on one leg and BPAS on the other um, and collected muscle four days later. And you can see that on this uh, blot that BPAS nicely reduced the, the B isoform. So for immediate next steps, we need to validate our proteomic changes um, by doing Western blots. We also plan to see if um, changes are, are due to altered transcription. Um, and then using this approach, we want to develop sort of a core profile of proteins that could serve as a, a biomarker of disease activity uh, for LGMD D1. And then lastly, we want to test if reducing the B isoform could be beneficial in our in our knock-in mouse model. And so again, I'd like to thank uh, Mei Peng, Jill Da, Sarah Pittman, and Rothio Bango Chea, who did all this work. And then Sui Fen's group at Caltech, who did the proteomics. And then Tim Miller's group um, for laying the groundwork using ASOs for isoform switching. And then also thank my funding sources. Thanks.